Well, hello everyone and welcome to Sporty's latest webinar. Today we're talking about a subject that's very important for really any pilot looking to the future and that's ADS-B. We'll be talking today about both the technology behind ADS-B, the portable products that are out there, and also the panel installed products that are out there so that as we get closer to that big 2020 date, we can all hopefully make the right decision about equipment and uh, maybe even see some benefits from this and, and not just see ADS-B as a mandate. I uh, thank you for joining us today. We're going to cover a lot of ground, and uh, hopefully you walk out of here with a lot of information you didn't know before. My name is John Zimmerman. I'll be your presenter today. Uh, I get to work right there at Sporties at the Claremont County Airport in Ohio. And in that role, I get to spend a lot of time thinking about and talking about ADSB projects, uh, both portable receivers and the installed uh, products. We sell in our Sporties Pilot Shop business a number of portable ADSB receivers. What you may not know, though, is that Sporties also uh, owns and operates an avionics shop. So we spend a lot of time working with the panel installed products as well. Uh, but really more than that background, I come to you today as an active pilot. Uh, I fly a number of different airplanes and I'm actively involved out there in the, in the ATC system. And I want to bring you that sort of experience and, and those tips and those informations that I've learned really as a pilot speak to you uh, pilot to pilot today. Quick overview of what we're going to cover today. We're going to spend about half the presentation talking about ADSB in general and the technology and the terms. So we'll start with what is ADSB. While that may seem obvious, it's important to define what we're talking about before we spend an hour talking about it. We'll talk about some key terms and try to uh, unmask some of the jargon that's out there. We'll explain how ADSB works so you understand the system behind what you see on your iPad or what you see in your panel. And then we'll see it in action. So in the second half of the presentation, we'll talk about panel mount avionics options and what you might consider for equipping for that 2020 deadline. Then we'll also talk about portable avionics, uh, which have been a very hot product the last couple of years. And then finally, we'll end with some tips and advice, uh, some thoughts on how to fly with ADS-B the right way. So with all that to cover, we're gonna go ahead and dive right in. Uh, to our presentation. Let's start with a system overview. Uh, this can get complicated at times, but I think it's really important to understand how ADSB works uh, at a basic level because when we understand that, I think it's easier to make good decisions about what we want out of a, an ADSB avionics package. So, number one is where did ADSB come from? I think some pilots might think that ADSB is an evil plot dreamt up by the FAA to take a bunch of money from us by 2020. And while there's an element of that that certainly uh, hits home, ADSB really started as a research project. If you've been flying long, you probably remember reading about the Capstone program in Alaska in the 1990s. This was really a, a research project the FAA did to consider if some new technology could help safety. Uh, Alaska really depends on general aviation. It's a key part of their culture and their economy. But the safety record, frankly, was pretty awful. And so the FAA looked at using new technology like GPS receivers and maybe a, a network of ground stations to transmit those, those locations, but also weather. And if we use technology like that, could safety actually be affected? Well, the overwhelming answer was really yes. Uh, it did make a difference in the accident record. And the reason I bring that up is that really the ADS-B system we have now is built on that foundation of capstone. Uh, proved a lot of technologies there, proved some of the theory of it, uh, and, and is built on that to what we have today. What you may not realize, though, is the final ADS-B out rules, the so-called mandate, were finalized in 2011, uh, which is now a, a little ways to go. So this is a fairly mature system now. The, the regulations have been set. The ground station, as we'll talk about later, is complete, at least in its initial form. So the entire U.S. is covered with ADSB ground stations. And as we'll also talk about later, the options for hardware, both portable and panel, are tremendous. There are uh, dozens of options out there. So the point is, this is a pretty mature system now. I think some pilots have looked at ADSB and have been concerned that uh, maybe it wasn't quite time to jump into this market or maybe this whole thing wasn't really going to go. Um, I think it's pretty well settled down now. You've got a lot of options in terms of hardware. The regula regulatory side of things is pretty well settled. And the infrastructure, at least in terms of how pilots interact, is pretty well set. 
So with that basic understanding, let's look at some terms. We always show this slide about meaningless jargon spoken here because, boy, we do that in aviation. We uh, have a tendency to really throw around terms and not everybody understands what they mean. So let's take a few minutes and let's talk about what these words mean that you hear and read about so much. Words like ADSB out and ADSB in, 978 versus 1090, FISB and TISB. We'll start with next gen. Next gen is a word you hear uh, oftentimes from the FAA. This is sort of the overarching plan the FAA has to really reinvent how we do air traffic control in America. As they say, it's the, the move from ground-based to satellite-based. Uh, really, when you think about things like RNAV and uh, ADSB and uh, air traffic control modernization. You can see the goals of next gen, they're admirable. They want to shorten routes, save time and fuel, reduce traffic delays, increase capacity, increase safety. And I added the last bullet there, world peace and free beer, because I think that's the only thing the FA left off. Uh, I mean, I'm being silly here, but the point is the FA uses this really as a catch-all term for all of their uh, proposals to Congress for modernizing ATC. So next gen, pretty broad word. And actually, we won't use it much tonight. That's because ADSB and next gen are not interchangeable. Sometimes you'll hear those thrown around a lot, um, but they're not the same thing. ADSB is one of the core parts of next gen, but it's not the same. Next gen really has five major elements. Uh, most of those have to do with air traffic control and, and software upgrades and radar upgrades and things like that. But ADSB is just one of those. So you'll hear us talk about ADSB tonight, not next gen. So what is ADSB? It's a term that gets thrown around a lot, and it's an acronym like so many things in aviation. ADSB stands for Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. It's a horrible clunker of a name no marketing person would ever come up with. But in spite of that, it is fairly descriptive if you look at all four of those words. It's automatic because it works in the background. So whereas your transponder, you may have to hit the ident button. You don't have to do that with ADSB. Your ADSB avionics are constantly transmitting. It's dependent because this whole concept of sort of network air traffic control depends on all the airplanes out there being equipped with ADSB out avionics. If only half the airplanes are equipped, the system really doesn't work very well. So it's dependent upon everybody being equipped. Surveillance means it's simply a way to track aircraft, just like radar is a surveillance technology. And then broadcast. Again, this gets back a little bit towards that first word, automatic, in that your aircraft is continuously broadcasting its position and velocity. It's not waiting to be interrogated by radar. It's constantly sending it out. Okay, so far so good. That's what ADSB is. But where we, things get complicated is that ADSB gets split up into two different products, ADSB out and ADSB in. ADSB out, this is really the surveillance. Uh, technology. You can think of this as the transponder in your airplane. Uh, if you have an ADSB out transponder in your airplane, which will pretty much most of us have to have by 2020, that's reporting your aircraft's position, velocity, and, and altitude once per second. Uh, so th this is the piece that's in the panel that's transmitting out to ATC. This is the piece, again, you will be required to have by uh, January 1st, 2020, if you're operating basically anywhere you need a mode C transponder today. So class A airspace, B airspace, C airspace, above 10,000 feet. Um, pretty much if you need a mode C transponder today, you're gonna need ADSB out in 2020. So this is the mandate piece. If you hear about the 2020 mandate or the ADSB mandate, they're talking about ADSB out. In contrast, ADSB in is totally optional. This part we can do if we want to, but we don't have to. Now, the reason many pilots do equip with ADSB in is that it has a lot of value. This is the, the, the technology that allows us to receive transmissions coming into our aircraft. This is the free traffic and weather that's transmitted by the FAA. If you're flying with a Stratus or a GDL 39 or a dual XGPS 170, a portable product like that, that's ADSB in. So those are the two basic components of ADSB. One is sending out position reports. One is receiving in weather and traffic. Now from there, things get unfortunately even more complicated. Within ADSB in and ADSB out, there are two different data links, 978 megahertz and 1090. 
confusing, but it is what it is. We're going to skip a lot of the history. Uh, let's just say that there are these two data links for different reasons, partially for frequency congestion, partially for other things. The reality is they exist. And they're really, as I mentioned, just two different data links. They're frequencies. 1,090 megahertz extended squitter. Sometimes you'll hear that referred to as 1090 ES. And then 978, 978 megahertz, sometimes called a universal access transceiver or a UAT. So if you hear 1090 versus 978 or 1090 ES versus 978 UAT, that's what we're talking about. So let's walk through each of these. 1090 ES out. So we can have 1090 out, 1090 in. We can have 978 out, 978 in. Let's walk through all four of those. 1090 ES out uh, is based on the same frequency really that your transponder is today, your mode C transponder. And really, you can think of a 1090 ES transponder as pretty much just an upgraded version of what you have in your panel today. In fact, some mode S transponders, like the GTX 330 from Garmin, can be upgraded to an ES transponder to meet the mandate uh, if you add a WAS GPS to it and do a software upgrade. So uh, think of this as just a souped up transponder. It's worth noting that 1090 ES is the only ADSB transmitter that's accepted outside the US and it's uh, required above 18,000 feet. So if you're flying internationally or you fly a turbine or a pressurized airplane and you're going above 18,000 feet, 1090 ES is what you're gonna use. Worth remembering again, uh, all ADSB out products have to be certified and installed. So there's no such thing as a portable 1090 out. 978 out, same basic idea. It's sort of like a transponder. Uh, the difference here is it's really an add-on to your existing transponder. So a 978 UAT uh, is designed to be remote mounted in most cases. You see here a Garmin GDL88. This is mounted usually in the tail of the aircraft and it transmits your aircraft position and velocity and altitude. Um, and it transmits that out, but it doesn't replace your transponder. So you'll still have to carry a mode C transponder if you have a 978 UAT. This was really developed for general aviation to try to have a lower cost option. So it's only allowed in the US and it's only allowed below 18,000 feet. But you know, if you're flying a Cherokee or a 172 or even a Cirrus, uh, it's probably just fine for that. It is less expensive than 1090 ES. We'll talk about later, there's no free lunch though in aviation. The installation is usually more for these products. But at the end of the day, you can think of this as sort of a remote mount version that works with your transponder, whereas 1090 ES is a transponder replacement. 1090 ES in, now we're talking about the inside of things. And you don't hear much about 1090 in, but there is such a thing. You can really think of this as traffic. What you get with 1090 ES in is you can detect other aircraft that are equipped with 1090 ES. You can also receive traffic reports from the ground stations, the ADSB ground stations. But it's important to note that this does not receive weather. So uh, 1090, you can think traffic only in terms of the in part. 978 in is probably the part that most pilots are familiar with. This also has a traffic element. You can detect other aircraft with 978 out. You can also receive traffic reports from ground stations. But the big piece here is that 978 receivers are what can receive ADSB weather. These are what can receive the, the subscription free weather product that the FAA sends out. So again, if you're using a Stratus or a GDL 39 or something like that, you're, you're using a 978 in receiver. These can be portable or installed, as you see here, both options. So the only reaction to this is, are you confused yet? Because that is sort of a mind-numbing array of options and technologies and numbers and letters. Well, here's sort of how I'd sum it up, maybe the cheat sheet. You can think of 1090 out as the big guys, uh, above 18,000 feet, international, turboprops, jets. It doesn't have to be that. Uh, you could put 1090 out in a 172, and many people do. But as a shortcut, think of this as, as the big boys. 1090 in is traffic only, no weather. 978 out, you can think of that as the piston ADSB out option. And 978 in, think of that as weather and traffic. Now there's two more terms we'll talk about here before we move on. Um, and you don't hear them too much, but just in case you see them get tossed around, it's important to know what they mean. First one is FISB, 
or FIS-B, stands for Flight Information Services Broadcast. Really, the better word for this is weather, and that's what we'll call it tonight, because that's really what this is. If you're receiving uh, radar, METARs, TAFs, PIREPs, TFRs, things like that, that's FISB. That's the weather product. This is constantly broadcast by the FAA's network of ADSB ground stations. They're out there pumping out FISB all the time. The other piece is TISB, or Traffic Information Services Broadcast. This is sort of the cousin to the FISB product. This is the traffic part of it, where the ground stations again send out traffic. Now, the important thing to note here is, though, that traffic is not like weather. It's not just broadcast to anybody and everybody. We'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. One other important note, though, on traffic, on TIS-B, this is not the same as Mode S or TIS traffic. If you've flown with a Garmin GTX 330, which was a very popular Mode S transponder for years, you could receive through that TIS traffic, uh, which is traffic uplinked from mostly uh, approach control. So if you were near a Class B or Class C airspace, you could get uplinked to you a traffic picture, and that's very, very handy, but that's going to eventually be replaced by TIS-B, and TIS-B is a little different. It doesn't work the same. So if you've heard about TIS traffic or Mode S traffic, uh, understand that what we're dealing with with ADS-B traffic is something that's a little bit different. All right, now that we've done a little bit of the background and talked about the, the some of the words and some of the jargon, let's talk about how this really works and how the system operates, and then we'll put it in action and see what it looks like in terms of avionics. We'll start with traffic because traffic is probably the most complicated subject when it comes to ADSB, and need to understand really how this works to understand how to get the most out of it. We'll do it for starters by contrasting it with weather because weather is easy. FISB or that ADSB weather product that's broadcast continuously. You might think of this as a dumb transmission. It's like an AM radio station. Those ground stations are continuously pumping out weather information. If you have the radio tuned to the right channel which in this case is 978, you can receive weather, nothing more to it. Traffic is different though. Traffic is what I would compare to text messaging, where traffic is only sent to you in reply to a, an outgoing transmission. So it's not just gonna send every piece of traffic in the entire world up to everybody. What happens here is an aircraft flies over that's equipped with ADS-B out. It sends out, sends out its position and its velocity. The, that sort of wakes up the ground stations. The ground stations see that, and they send back to that ADSB out aircraft what we call a hockey puck of information. It's 30 miles in diameter, 3,500 feet high, and that'll show every aircraft in that hockey puck. But the hockey puck is centered on the ADSB out aircraft. So it's not everything. It's really a message meant for that airplane. The good news is it'll show not just ADSB out equipped airplanes, it'll show anybody with a transponder basically. So the ground station is sending back a really full traffic report. That's really nice, but the problem is if we're not ADSB out equipped ourselves, we're dependent upon others to be that way. So what will happen sometimes is you'll be flying along and you'll be somewhat close to another aircraft that has ADSB out. And if you're in their hockey puck, you can sort of receive their hockey puck and see the traffic picture. So that's great, you can get this, this pretty decent traffic picture. The problem is it's not meant for you, it's meant for the other airplane. So it's gonna be an incomplete picture, and it's one of these situations where you don't know what you don't know. Since most of us don't have ADS-B out yet, um, it, it's, it's really in and out. So if you hear someone describe ADS-B traffic as spotty, that's very accurate. It's not even something you can quantify. It's not like, oh, you get 25% of the airplanes out there with ADS-B traffic. Sometimes you'll get zero, sometimes you'll get 80%. It really depends, and that's what's so difficult about this. One other piece, though, to understand about ADSB traffic is you can receive what's called air-to-air -air traffic. So in this case, an ADSB out airplane flies past. Again, he's continuously transmitting his location, and if you have an ADSB receiver, even if it's a portable, you'll receive that transmission directly from the other airplane. So you're not dependent on any ground stations in this scenario. You get his report directly. What you need those ground stations for is to fill in the gap. That is, if everyone were equipped with ADS-B out, well, you'd just see them air to air. But since we all aren't, in fact, since most of us aren't, those ground stations fill in the gaps. 
you'll get into this air-to-air -air traffic thing when you, when you start talking about single band versus dual band ADSB receivers. Um, single band receivers only receive on 978. So they get 978 weather and 978 traffic. Dual band receivers get 978 weather, 978 traffic, and also 1090 traffic. What that means is you'll see more traffic. Um, it, it certainly won't get you to 100%. But you'll see more traffic. You'll see everybody who has 978 or 1090, you'll see them air to air. And hopefully, you'll from time to time get that ground station uplink. Um, so, dual band, yes, you'll see more traffic than single band, no doubt. But uh, it's still not a complete traffic picture. Now, that's all kind of confusing. So, let's put it into words, maybe, or into pictures here, and maybe it'll be easier to understand. We'll go through three scenarios here. First is a pretty typical situation. Here's where we're flying in our Cessna 172, right in the middle of the screen there. And we have a Stratus portable ADS-B receiver on the side window. So portable ADS-B in, but we do not have ADS-B out in our airplane. And in this case, we're not even in range of an ADS-B ground station. So what we're dependent on here is, again, that air-to-air -air traffic. So here we see that Baron out there in front of us, and he has ADS-B out. And so we'll see his airplane regardless of ground stations. He's transmitting out, we're receiving his location, uh, his position and velocity air to air. But you'll notice we don't see that Cessna 172 that's out there and we don't see that Pilatus that's behind us. And we don't know we don't see them. There's no way to know that. So we'll see some traffic, not a complete picture. Here's another fairly typical situation. Here we are in the 172. We still have a Stratus, a portable receiver. We do not have ADSB out, but we're close to that other airplane that has ADSB out, and there's an ADSB ground station involved here. So you see where we are. We're inside that Baron's hockey puck. So we get all the aircraft that are centered around him. So what that means is, in addition to the Baron, which we saw before, we now see that Cessna 172 out front, which is great. We are sort of sniffing the hockey puck of information that was sent to the Baron, and we've got more traffic. Again, this works really, really well, and that's accurate traffic out there, but we don't know what we don't know, and that Pilatus is still behind us, and we have no idea he's there, and we don't know that we don't see him. It, it's not like the hockey puck is drawn on the map, and we know where the traffic information is coming from. The only way really to be for sure is this third scenario, and here we have a Stratus, but we have ADSB out in our airplane. In this example, we're transmitting out, we're creating our own hockey puck of information. So we're getting a full traffic picture centered on us. And here we see all three airplanes. So this is really the, the, the ultimate setup. Once we have ADS-B out, you get that full traffic picture. So the key takeaway here out of all that ADS-B traffic mess is that unless you're squawking ADS-B out, unless you have one of those in your panel, and you're creating your own customized hockey puck of information, you're not getting a complete picture of surrounding traffic. You need to stay paranoid in that case. It's great when you have ADSB traffic. Certainly, if it calls traffic one mile, same altitude, you should try to miss them, no doubt about it. The issue is it's not complete. Here's just an example of uh, same app, same airplane with and without ADSB out. You can see on the right, no ADSB out. Don't have much to look at. On the left, we do have ADSB out, and we have lots and lots of targets. We have really a full picture. Okay, so that's traffic. Let's look at weather now. Weather, as I mentioned, is a little bit simpler because it's just continuously broadcast by the ADSB ground station. But there are a couple of uh, minor points to understand about weather. And one is that there are four different types of ADSB ground stations out there. You can think of this sort of like VORs, where there are different types of VOR. Same thing, we have surface, low altitude, medium altitude, and high altitude ADSB stations. And it's not a big deal. In, in everyday flying, it really doesn't matter. This is not something you track or particularly care about. But I bring this up here because you'll notice that the different stations transmit different information. So you can get in a situation in particular where maybe you take off and you're just climbing out, you're at low altitude, and you see radar within 150 miles of your airplane but you don't see radar for the entire U.S. And you may think st something's wrong. Well, it's not wrong. What's probably happening is you're just receiving a surface or low altitude station. 
as you can see there, low altitude and surface stations give you that 150 mile regional NEXRAD image, that radar image, but they do not include what's called the CONUS NEXRAD or the Continental United States NEXRAD. You need to get a medium or a high altitude station to start receiving that Continental US radar. Now again, in everyday use, when you're up at altitude, you're cruising along at five or 6,000 feet or something like that, you'll have five, six, 10, 12 ADSB stations. So you'll be getting a medium or a high. It's not a big deal. But there are certain scenarios where you can be low altitude and maybe you're not getting a medium or a high station and you won't see that full continental US radar. So that's what it means. Uh, if, if you've heard something like, well, ADSB radar isn't nationwide. That's not true. It's just transmitted as a separate product, and there there may be some times when you don't have it. Although I'll tell you in that my three plus years of flying with ADSB, I've almost always had continental US radar. So how old is the weather? That's another question that's worth uh, understanding. The short answer is if you're familiar with XM weather, uh, satellite data link weather, it's really pretty similar. Um, you can see again the radar imagery is is broken up into two products, the regional and the CONUS. Regional is updated every five minutes, the continental U.S. radar every 15 minutes. Airmats, SIGMATS, METARs, NOTAMs every five minutes. So it's not real time, no data link weather is, but uh, it's, it's pretty up to date, about as up to date as anything you're going to fly with in terms of data link. Here's maybe a more direct comparison if you are familiar with the XM weather product from, say, a Garmin uh, portable GPS or something like that. Uh, the difference here is that XM, I would say overall, is a premium product. It's satellite-based, so it works everywhere in the U.S. at any altitude. ADSB is ground-based, so you typically need to be in the air to receive it. Um, and there are a couple of weather products you don't get with ADSB, notably satellite imagery and lightning. Uh, you do get TFRs and special use airspace and NOTAMs on ADSB, uh, but the big one's really there at the bottom, right? XM is a premium product, and you do pay for it. It's thirty-five up to hundred dollars a month. ADSB is free because your tax dollars already paid for it. So, I think what many pilots have said is, XM is maybe a better-looking product overall, but uh, ADSB is free, and that's pretty powerful. Here's a comparison now of those three radar products. So, XM again, high-resolution radar, and ADSB you may have heard can have sort of a blocky radar picture. Well, that's true, but again, we're really talking about the CONUS picture. So here's the same app, four flight, XM on the left, CONUS radar on the middle, regional ADSB radar on the right. And you can see on the left that XM weather is beautiful. It's high resolution, it's, it's detailed. The national picture in the middle, that CONUS, is pretty blocky and doesn't look great. But if you look over there at the regional ADSB picture, it, it's not quite as good as, as XM, but it's pretty darn good. It's certainly good enough. Even the example in the middle, take that national radar picture, as blocky as that is, would anybody really fly through that? I mean, the point is, we're, you know, we're, we're trying to get weather information here. We're not watching a football game in HD. And even at that blocky level there, it's still plenty enough to know that that's a really ugly system and we have no business flying through it. So I will tell you, in my experience flying with ADSB, practically uh, it's the same as XM in terms of what you get out of it and the strategic planning you can do with it. So where do you have coverage? That's obviously a key, key point. Uh, you have to be in, in range of an ADSB ground station. Here's the FAA's estimated coverage map at 1,500 feet. And you can see uh, it's actually really good east of the Mississippi. Most places, uh, even at you know just above pattern altitude, you'll have great coverage. Out west, certainly in the mountains, a little bit patchier. But look when you get up to 5,000 feet. Here's the FAA's map at 5,000 feet. You can see coverage is really excellent almost everywhere all over the eastern U.S., all over Texas, up and down the west coast. Um, really only over the most rugged terrain is it a little patchy there. But it's like it's like VORs or communications. This is line of sight, so the higher you go, the better it gets. Uh, if you're at 5,000 and there's a little dead patch there over southern uh, South Dakota, uh, as you get higher there, if you went up to seven, 8,000 feet, uh, I suspect that would fill in. All right, so now we understand some of the theory behind ADSB, some of the terms behind it and how it works. Let's put that into action now, and we'll look at both panel mount and portable ADSB avionics and see when it might make sense to fly with some of these different options. Just as a review, we're talking about ADSB in the panel. Here are five things you need to remember. ADSB out will be required in most airspace where remote C transponder is required today by January 1st, 2020. 
That's the mandate. Important footnote that some pilots miss is it's not enough to have an ADSB out transponder. You also have to have an approved position source, um, which practically speaking means a WASP GPS. That has to be attached to your ADSB solution because after all, you're reporting out your own position. Air traffic control and the FAA want to know that you're reporting your position with some uh, accuracy. Number three, ADSB out compliance must be panel mount. Uh, again, there's no portable ADSB out. Portables are ADSB in only. That ADSB in equipage is uh, totally optional. Don't have to do that. The mandate is only out. And reminder that if you choose a 978 megahertz option or a UAT option, you do still need to keep your mode C transponder. So what about experimental aircraft? There's some a little bit of confusion uh, last year about uh, really what was allowed and did uh, experimental aircraft have to put TSO to avionics and all that. Uh, the FAA has cleared this up, I think, pretty well. As you can read there, non-TSO ADS-B out avionics may be installed on amateur built and light sport aircraft with experimental airworthiness cert certificates. So you don't have to get a certified TSO product to put in experimental aircraft. Um, SLSAs, uh, so not non-experimental light sport aircraft, must be approved by the manufacturer. Not a big deal, but just make sure you do your homework there uh, if, you, if you own a light sport aircraft. Same with glass cockpits. Uh, this can get tricky, but glass cockpits, the avionics are part of the aircraft type certificate. So it really belongs to, uh, you know, Cessna or Diamond more than it belongs to Garmin or Bendix King. So you need to, again, be, be careful on your av avionics in a glass cockpit airplane. What about portables, too? As we mentioned, um, you know, there's some talk about this, and wouldn't it be great to have a portable ADS-B out just like we have portable ADS-B in? Well, it's certainly a nice idea, and it's technically feasible in most cases, but this is not something that's going to happen, so I wouldn't waste any time uh, hoping or waiting for this to come. The analogy here is it, it really would be like an IFR approach-approved portable GPS. So you can't go buy a Garmin 796 handheld GPS and fly a WAS approach down at 200 feet. Um, it's just not the, so the integrity and, and the assurance that it's going to work properly. It's the same thing. If the FAA is going to separate a 747 from your Cessna based on the position source and everything, it needs to know for sure that this thing is installed properly, paired to an end number, and it's giving accurate position reports. As the FAA says here, they, they pretty much spell it out, I think, as clearly as they can. Portable ADSB out systems, also known as suitcase units, should not be operated, that is, transmitting, aboard any aircraft. While marketing associated with these units may imply approval for use by way of an FCC license, the FAA prohibits their use. So pretty clear there that portables, not going to happen, not going to be approved for 2020, uh, not something they even want you to be operating. So let's look at some of the options now in the market for panel mount ADSB. The first is probably the most popular out there. This is Garmin's GDL88. This is a 978 megahertz option, a UAT. Lots of different options here. You can get it uh, as out only. You can get it as out and in. You can get it with the required GPS. You can get it without a GPS if you already have a WASP GPS. You can get it with or without dual antennas, what Garmin calls diversity, which is uh, typically more important for higher performance, uh, high altitude aircraft. Uh, it works with GTN and GNS series navigators from Garmin. So if you had a, uh, let's say you had a Garmin G500 glass cockpit that you'd put in and you had a Garmin 530W, uh, GDL88 would be a nice option for remote mounting that would check the box on 2020, it would tie into your existing 530W, uh, and you could also upgrade it to receive ADS-B in if you wanted to. This also works with Garmin's new Connect system. This is the uh, a product called Flightstream. And Flightstream is like a little Bluetooth bridge you put in your panel, and it allows you to send ADSB weather that this GDL88 uh, receives, and you can send that ADSB weather from your panel to your tablet, like an iPad or an Android. So it's kind of a nice way to get additional value out of this. It is remote mounted, like most of these 978 products, and uh, again, price is kind of all over the place because of different options, but just as a starting point, about $4,000. Garmin also has a product called GDL84, and this is sort of an all-in-one solution. So this has 978 out, 
It also has 978 and 1090 in, so you get the weather and traffic in. This does include the WASP GPS, so you have an approved position source, and it includes that flight stream product we were just talking about. So it's really kind of all in one. If you had maybe an older panel, you didn't have that G500 glass cockpit, you had maybe an old 430 that didn't have a WASP upgrade, this would be a nice solution that would uh, really solve all of those problems. It has the position source, it has the ADSB out and in, and the wireless link to your iPad. Um, a pretty nice option. Like the GDL88, it's remote mounted and again about $4,000 starting price. Lastly from Garmin, they do have a 1090 solution. It's the GTX 330ES. If it looks like a transponder, that's because that's really what it is. It's an upgraded transponder. So 1090ES out, it's panel mounted so it would replace your existing Mode C transponder. It does not have a GPS in it so if you didn't have a WASP GPS in your panel already, this is not going to be the choice for you. And I mentioned earlier, if you have an older GTX 330 without the ES, you can upgrade it to the ES in most cases. It's about a $1,200 software upgrade uh, that if you check with your avionics shop, you can do pretty quickly and easily. Uh, and again, about $4,000 list price for the whole system. Free Flight is another uh, ADSB manufacturer you see out there and has been aggressive on pricing. They have a number of different products like most of these companies. Uh, at the basic end, end the Ranger Lite, which is a uh, ADSB out on 978 and includes the GPS, uh, starts at 19.95, so very aggressive price. It is remote mounted, so again, as we'll talk about, a little more to install, but certainly aggressive price, and uh, is STC on a number of different airplanes. L3, big avionics company, uh, just in the last year released their Lynx lineup. This is really a comprehensive lineup of ADSB out avionics, starting in from the NGT 1000, which is 978 out without a GPS, so sort of a bare bones basic unit at a really good price of about $2,000. All the way up, you can go up to their NGT 9000 line, which is a 1090 solution, so a transponder replacement. Um, and you can really go nuts with this. It even includes a touchscreen display, and that NGT 9000 D Plus is both ADSB and an active traffic system on top of it. So really sort of the, the Cadillac solution. Um, it is STC'd on a lot of different airplanes. Again, they have 978 and 1090, so you have a remote mount option or the panel mount option. And prices, as you would expect, with the range of capabilities from about 2000 up to over 12000 for that deluxe model. Lastly, Apario, the company that does the Stratus portable ADSB receivers, uh, has announced a product called Stratus ESG. Uh, it's an all-in-one box, so it's 1090 ES out. So that, again, this would be a transponder replacement. Pull out your Mode C transponder, put this in. It's a transponder and it's ADSB out, and it has the WASP GPS built in. So again, if you had an older airplane or you had an airplane with that didn't have a WASP GPS in it already, this would be an economical way to get ADSB out with that position source you need. Uh, because it's panel mount, again, the, those panel mount do tend to be a lot less expensive to install. Um, the other neat part about Stratus ESG is that it can interface with your Stratus portable receiver. The way that works is your Stratus portable receiver could plug into Stratus ESG, and that take, takes advantage of the aircraft's uh, belly-mounted antenna and for ADSB and roof-mounted antenna for GPS. So you have really improved ADSB and GPS reception, and you have full-time power coming from uh, the ship's power. So it's a way to really pair a certified ADSB out product with a portable ADSB in product, and they work as a system. Stratus ESG is 3490. That does include the GPS antenna and mounting hardware, so it's really all in one. Uh, not certified yet, but they're expecting to certify and ship that in early 2016. So, given all that, there's lots of options, and there's even some we didn't cover there. Uh, I think those are the most popular ones, but how do, you, how do you pick? How do you make a decision? Well, here are some questions I think to consider. First, do you ever fly above 18,000 feet or outside the U.S.? Because if you do, it's, it's easy. You need a 1090 solution. 978 is not going to be an option for you. If you don't fly above 18,000 or outside the U.S., 978 may be a good option for you. Don't have to use it but it may be a good option. It may be a way to save some money. 
Another important question is about your mode C transponder. How good is your mode C transponder right now? Because again, uh, if you're going to put in a 978 solution, you need to keep your mode C transponder. And if you have a 25 year old, uh, you know, KT 76 a or something like that, that has a cavity tube in it, um, that's going bad. It may make more sense to use a 1090 for your ADSB upgrade because you'll get the ADSB compliance, but you'll also get a new transponder. Now, if you've got a brand new uh, digital transponder that you like and you're happy with, uh, that's a case where a 978, again, might save you money. But just consider that, that your transponder really kind of needs to be in your calculations in terms of your ADSB upgrade for your airplane. Do you have a WASP GPS? Another important question. If you have one already, you may be able to buy a solution that has no GPS in it and save some money. If you don't have a WASP GPS in your airplane, it's important that you have to buy a solution that has that in there. It's not enough just to add ADSB out. Got to have a WASP GPS connected to it. Another question to consider is, do you already have an ADSB in portable? So again, if you're flying with a GDL 39, for example, and you're happy with it, maybe you don't need to buy ADSB in for your panel. You've already got it with a portable and it works. And that could save you some money. So just consider the current avionics you have and how that's working. Because again, if, uh, if you already have in with a portable, it's a way to save some money. Lastly, I think one of the most important things to consider is that ADSB is really, it's all about the install, is what we like to say. So it's not enough just to think about the cost of the hardware. The installation cost can easily be as much as the hardware. So make sure whenever you're shopping for ADSB out for your panel, consider the hardware, but also work with your avionics shop. Get a quote that's realistic about the installation because some pilots have been gotten some rude surprises when they didn't do their homework and they thought they were into ADSB for $2,000 and it ended up being a four or $5,000 bill by the time it's installed. So make sure you ask questions and get a, get a real quote. In general, those 978 boxes are less expensive on the hardware side, but they're more expensive on the installation side, sometimes almost double. So again, make sure you get it quoted out, everything installed. Last thing to point out there is that there have been a, a fair number of installation errors, nothing critical, but just sort of uh, things that are not set up properly, uh, settings that aren't right, and the FAA has seen some, some problems with this. There is a way to check the status of your ADSB out transponder and make sure it's good. You see the email address there at the bottom. I can't make that up. That really is the email address. It's it's quite a lot there. So take a second there and write that down, that 9-AWA-AFS, etc. What you can do is send an email to that address, and the FAA will send back to you what they're seeing on their end. What is, what is air traffic control seeing? What end number are you reporting? What's the quality of the signal you're sending out? It's actually a very nice detailed report. So if you have any question about how your ADSB situation is set up, uh, send an email there with your end number and, and get a report. So when to equip with ADSB out? Well, I don't think you have to fall all over yourself and go do it right this second. But I think the days of waiting it out and uh, hoping for things to get better are probably over. I think if you're thinking at all about an avionics upgrade, ADSB needs to be part of it. Um, if your mode C transponder is failing or has gone bad, for goodness sake, I would not fix a mode C transponder at this point. Go ahead and upgrade it, put in an ADSB out transponder. There's no point in spending $1,200 to repair an, an old uh, analog transponder at this point. And there are some benefits. So again, you see the quote here from uh, one of the writers for Vertical Magazine. He upgraded his Cessna 310, I believe. Uh, and he said, you know, I, I did it now instead of waiting and it was worth it because what you get with ADSB out is again you get that hockey puck of traffic centered on you so you get a full traffic picture yes we have to do ADSB out for the mandate and that can be kind of a drag but you do get the benefit of a full traffic picture so uh, in this author's opinion what he was saying was if I got to do it anyway I might as well do it now and start enjoying the benefits of it so there's a look at the, at the panel side of things. We want to also talk about the portable side of things with portable ADSB receivers. Portables have uh, been really popular the last few years, and that's because you get really many of the benefits of an installed ADSB system, but for a lot less money. Um, again, it doesn't meet the mandate, but you get a lot of the benefits in terms of the weather and traffic products. 
The iPad's been the game changer there because it's finally an easy way to display the weather and traffic products. Portable receivers are also great for renters or if you're in a flying club. Again, in that situation, you may not control the avionics in your panel, so it's not up to you. But you do control the portable side of it, so you can always have that with you. Reminder again, portable ADS-B devices are in only. Uh, and there are lots of options to choose, for, choose from, as we'll show you here in just a second. Start out with Sky Radar. They have uh, probably the, they're probably one of the first companies to really design a portable ADS-B receiver. It's been around for a while. And they have two models, the D and the DX. They both receive ADS-B weather and they both have GPS. And that's something you'll see that's constant across really the entire market. Table stakes here is ADS-B weather and GPS. They both have dual band traffic. So again, that 978 and 1090 traffic for not a complete, but a better traffic picture. Higher end model adds an AHARS or an attitude heading reference system that allows you to get a backup attitude picture or a synthetic vision picture in your iPad app. Connects to your tablet by Wi-Fi and works with a number of apps, including Wing X, Droid EFB, and iFly. Probably the only knock on this product is it does require external power. So uh, if you want a battery powered solution, uh, this won't do it for you. But the prices are good, uh, $699 or $849 with an AHARS. Another good option is the iLevel 2, SW and AW. Again, they both do ADSB weather and GPS. Single band traffic, they both have AHARS built in. iLevel really kind of made a name for themselves with AHARS, so that's their specialty here. Works with a number of apps, including Wing X, FlyQ, and Xavion. Uh, the interesting part here is that they have an internal battery, but the SW model also has a solar panel on top, so that'll extend the battery life a little bit if you mount this up in your glare shield. It's $1,195 for the SW, and it's $1,395 for the AW. And the interesting thing about that AW is it adds a pedostatic input. So if you're a home builder and want your tablet and your ADS-B receiver to kind of be your whole um, instrument panel, that's a good option because it has that pedostatic uh, addition to it. Another popular option is the Dual XGPS 170. This is from Dual Electronics. They uh, make the very popular little red circular GPS unit that you've probably seen out before. This is like that, it has GPS, but also adds ADSB weather. Single band traffic, does have a built-in battery, works with a number of apps, including Wing X, FlyQ, and others. And the price here, I think this is, this is probably the least expensive option out there, uh, just under $500, uh, a good option for if you're shopping on a budget. Sage Tech has a couple of products called Clarity. Uh, very, very small. Uh, you can see the dimensions there on the screen. This thing fits in the palm of your hand. They do ADS-B weather and GPS, dual band traffic. The higher end model adds the AHARS for the attitude. They do have a built-in battery. Works with Wing X, FlyQ, and Flight Plan Go uh, apps. Again, very small size and lightweight. And it's 1150 or 1400 for the model with the AHARS. Garmin, certainly uh, one of the big names in, in avionics, and they are no stranger to this market. They have a product called the GDL39 and the GDL39 3D uh, that are ADS-B weather and GPS receivers. They receive dual band traffic. That 3D, as the name suggests, also has attitude in it, has the AHARS in it, so you can do backup attitude and synthetic vision. You can also add on a battery to these, so they can run off either the cigarette lighter or an, in, or an attached battery. They work with the Garmin Pilot app, which is a really solid app for both iOS and Android. One of the interesting things, though, is that these also work with Garmin portable GPSs. So if you had a Garmin 796, say, and you wanted to get ADS-B weather on that instead of paying for XM, you could do that with the GDL39. You could even do both. You could have a GDL39 driving your Garmin 796 and driving your iPad, which is nice for uh, some cockpits where pilots like to have a backup. GDL39 is $549 in the low end, and going all the way up to the GDL39 3D with attitude and a battery is $899. Finally is the Stratus line of products from Apario. The latest models are the 1S and 2S. These both do ADS-B weather and GPS. The 1S, as the name suggests, does single band traffic. The 2S does dual band. The 2S also adds the, the AHARS for attitude. Also adds a barometric pressure altitude sensor. 
and a flight data recorder to log and record all your flights. These also have a built-in battery. It's about eight hours, so it's a very good battery. No wires or antennas here. It makes a connection by Wi-Fi to your app. It's made for the Four Flight mobile app, and the prices are $549 for the 1S and $899 for the 2S. So given all those choices, there's certainly a lot there to pick from. How do you choose the right ADS-B receiver? Same question we, we asked with ADS-B out. Uh, I think step one is probably to choose an app first. You know, you've got to live with an app every time you use it, whether you're using ADS-B or not. So I think the app's really got to drive the hardware to a certain extent. Um, if you like ForeFlight, use ForeFlight. If you like WingX, use WingX. If you like Garmin Pilot, use Garmin Pilot. I think that comes first. If you're flying with ForeFlight, that means a Stratus 1S or 2S. Garmin Pilot means a GDL39 or GDL39 3D. Wing X or FlyQ, you have more options, like the Sky Radar, the Dual 170, the Clarity, or the Eye Level. But I think, again, that app comes first. Whichever one you like, that's sort of a Coke and Pepsi question. Whichever one it is, you should use it and then match the hardware. Some other things to think about. Again, choose the app first. Number two, the reception among all these is really comparable. You know, with the ADSB network being fully built out across the U.S., uh, I don't see a big difference in reception with these. Uh, one tower is enough. In most cases, again, you're going to see five plus. If you're in Florida, you may see 12 or 13 towers. So uh, ADSB reception, I'd say, is sort of like a cell phone. I don't compare reception on my cell phone because it just sort of works or it doesn't. Uh, in most cases, it works. Do consider battery life. So if you're gonna, if you don't like wires or you don't want to plug it in, a long battery life, um, which the Stratus and the Clarity both have, would be good for you. If you're maybe a home builder or you own your own airplane and you're going to sort of permanently wire in your ADS-B receiver, a battery may not mean anything to you, so that's not important. Decide if traffic is important. You know, if it's important to you, that dual band will get you more traffic. If traffic's not important to you, maybe you already have an active traffic system in your airplane, a single band is fine. The other thing to remember is if you are ADS-B out equipped, if you have something in your panel, single band is enough. Because you're creating that hockey puck of traffic information, you don't need that dual band to fill in the gaps. You're getting everything from those ground stations. Do you fly IFR? If you do, that AHARS may be a really nice uh, option for you because you get backup attitude. If not, or that attitude's not important, or you don't use synthetic vision, maybe you can skip the AHARS, and that would be a, uh, a way to save some money. Also consider the app hardware integration. Think about how that works with, how the hardware works with your favorite app. Can you do things like firmware upgrades in the app to make it simple to keep the product up to date? And remember that all these include a GPS, so you don't need a separate GPS. If you uh, if you own like a, a dual uh, 150 or a bad elf GPS, you don't need to have that and an ADSB receiver. The ADSB receiver would do both. So let's look at ADSB in action now in, in terms of portable and see what it looks like from the cockpit. We're going to use the example of four flight and Stratus because uh, it seems to be most pilots out there, or at least the most popular app among pilots is for flight. So let's run through a couple scenarios here, although really this information is applicable to really all the apps in most cases. First thing, it's obvious, but turn on your map layers. Uh, this is pretty similar again in most apps. If you want to look at the weather, you got to turn on the weather layer. So make sure you go up there and turn on radar if you want traffic, if you want radar, turn on traffic if you want traffic. Once you do that, you can overlay your ADS-B products on a number of different maps, including sectionals, IFR and route charts, or a world map. Uh, so customize it the way you want it. METARs and TAFs you can also overlay in addition to radar. The nice thing about METARs and TAFs here is you can tap on an airport and you can read both the raw METAR code or the plain English translation, which is nice. You see here we've, trapped, we've tapped on PRN and we've got a nice uh, visualization here that the visibility is two miles. You can see the, the timestamp that this was 13 minutes ago. It was received by ADSB. So that's great. And that's where I think many pilots get their METARs and TAFs. But it's also worth using the visual overlay. So you'll see what we have turned on here on the map layer is visibility. And you can see a lot of tens, meaning 10 miles or better visibility. You can see a three, a five. That gives you a lot of glance value. So I know right away that pretty much everywhere to the left of our airplane is great visibility, 10 miles or better. 
and it's color coded that way. As I get down into the rain, down the coast of South Carolina and Georgia there, there's some areas where visibility isn't, a, isn't as good. It goes from nine to seven to six to three. So what I encourage you to do is don't just read the raw METARs. Do the overlays on the map and get a big picture view. And you can do this in really any app. Uh, you can learn a lot from it. If you do want to read specifically airport information, you can also do that on the airports page in ForeFlight here. Tap on weather. You can see METARs and TAFs, winds aloft as well. TFRs, unfortunately, is an important thing to monitor these days, and that is transmitted on ADSB. So I like to always fly with the TFRs later on. You can tap on a TFR for more information. So this is the Washington ADIS for, as an example. Um, tap on that, and it'll tell you the effective altitudes and times. Airmets and SIGMETs are also valuable. This is a case where drawing it on a map really makes it better. So if you've ever been cruising along and hear air traffic control come on frequency and talk about a, uh, an airmet from 50 northwest to nowhere to 20 southwest to nowhere to 30 southeast to nowhere, it's sort of impossible to use that information. Well, when it's displayed on a map like this, it's much easier to see how it affects your route of flight tap on it again you get the altitudes and the times I think it makes these products much more much more usable and much more helpful I also like pilot reports a lot again you can overlay this in addition to radar and a base map uh, tap on it you can see they're color-coded here for icing or turbulence or visibility you can tap on it to get the details but this is an example where information and context is really powerful because same thing, you know, an example I give you, we were flying from Sun and Fun back to Sporties uh, one night, and we heard an aircraft come on and report severe turbulence, which is not a good thing. If you've ever been on, been on frequency and you hear a, a pirate for severe turbulence that's sort of near you or close to your altitude, really makes your heart drop because, uh, you know, severe turbulence is no fun for anybody. Well, about five minutes later, the pirate popped up uh, on foreflight, and the pilot was right in the middle of a giant red cell. So it's pretty obvious the reason he had encountered severe turbulence is he flew right into a thunderstorm. That put us at ease a little bit. We had a smooth ride home, never even spilled the coffee. Um, it's just an example of how information and context really helps, right? We have our position, we have our route, we have the radar, and we have the PIREP. All of those things playing together helps us make better decisions. Winds Aloft is also available. Uh, here's an example. We just tapped on an airport. You can see across the bottom you have those little buttons for METAR, TAF, or winds. Tap on that. You can see all the altitudes with the winds aloft and the temperatures. NOTAMs are also available. This from the airports page. Tap airports and then tap the NOTAMs tab. And traffic. Again, turn on that traffic layer and it may be limited if you're not ADSB out, but take what you get. It's certainly helpful. It's better than nothing. Here's an example up by Chicago where there's a lot of aircraft with ADSB out, a lot of airliners. So we've got a lot of uh, we've got a lot of traffic targets. You can tap on again uh, the target just like we do with airports for weather. Tap on traffic, you get more information. Here we can see we've got executive jet 375 and his altitude and his distance from us and his heading and speed. And we even see that he's using 1090 ADSB to transmit. And then a reminder that all these have GPS, so you can do all the good moving map and terrain and uh, side profile views and all those things you can do with the GPS will work with an ADSB receiver as well. Finally is the attitude piece. There's usually two ways to get this in the app. First is the standard sort of backup attitude indicator. Here's four flight with a split screen sort of glass cockpit presentation. In Garmin Pilot, for example, you can view it as sort of an old school um, vacuum powered uh, attitude indicator. Same idea, gives you real time pitch and roll. It's not approved for primary, certainly, but in an emergency, I would absolutely use it because it would be helpful in keeping the, keeping the blue side up. And in an emergency, that's really what counts. You can take that to the next level with synthetic vision, which most of the main apps, Garmin, ForeFlight, Wing X, all have synthetic vision options. And it may look like kind of a gimmick, but I gotta say it's actually really useful, I've found. So here we have uh, on the left, synthetic vision and ForeFlight. The terrain and obstacles are color coded. So green, you're well above it. Yellow means you're close. Red means you're gonna hit it. But you also have your pitch and roll right there in the middle of the screen. And that's driven by your portable ADSB receiver. 
it really gives you great situational awareness great for IFR flying but it's actually pretty good for VFR flying too I've found it can help you pick out an airport on a hazy day or keep track of a tall cell phone tower if you're flying low level so synthetic vision not a must-have but certainly something if you've ever tried I think you'd appreciate is awfully handy so finally I want to close with a few tips uh, for flying with a portable ADS-B receiver some things to think about to get the most out of it First of all, connecting it to your iPad, really simple. Uh, it's either Bluetooth or uh, Wi-Fi. For the purposes of this, they're the same. It's just a way to connect wirelessly short range. So turn your ADS-B receiver on, go to the settings app on your iPad, connect by Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, start up your app, and as we mentioned, turn on those weather overlays. Location really matters on an ADS-B receiver. And so I encourage you to take some time in your airplane and experiment with different locations. We're trying to balance different things with an ADS-B receiver. It's looking down to the ground for ADS-B. It's looking up to the sky for satellite reception for GPS. We need to keep it steady for the AHARs, for the attitude piece. It doesn't have to be perfectly level. You can see in that bottom picture it's mounted sideways. That's fine. It doesn't have to be perfectly level for the AHARs to work. But it does need to be stable. It can't be sliding around the cockpit. And then finally, I like to avoid direct sunlight when possible. Um, these all have, for the most part, big lithium batteries in them, just like your iPad, so they can overheat if they're exposed to the sun for too long. Most of these are pretty good about withstanding heat. I mean, that Stratus you see there, for example, has a fan built into it, so it'll, it'll stay pretty cool. But uh, when in doubt, I like to get it up off the panel. I really like that suction cup mounting you see there. I like to mount it on a side window. It gets better reception. It's out of the... Uh, out of the heat of the uh, glare shield and frankly it's out of my way there's no reflection in the window if you do have reception issues you do have a couple options a couple things to think about first external antennas are available for almost all these units so if you wanted to run a like a rubber duck antenna and stick it up high in the side window that almost always helps reception if you fly a jet or a turboprop and you have heated windshields those can have an effect that doesn't kill it. That doesn't mean these don't work in those aircraft. There are plenty of ADS-B receivers flying, even on airliners and military jets. It's just something to think about. Think about whether maybe you have a, an unheated side windshield you could use or a, a triangular DV window on some airplanes. Uh, again, in almost every airplane, you can get it to work. You just need to be thoughtful about where you put it. And then the last one there I mentioned earlier, don't get caught up in low versus high towers and which tower you get and how many. As long as you have a couple towers and you're getting weather, it really doesn't matter. And again, in practical use, most places at cruise altitude, you'll have well over six or seven towers, so it's nothing to worry about. It is very important to check your status, though. Uh, if you're depending on ADSB weather to know what, what Mother Nature is doing out there, you need to know the status of it. So every app has its own version of a status page. The example here is the Stratus status menu on ForeFlight. That's on the Maps page. You tap on that little gear symbol there at the top left. Uh, Garmin has the same thing as the Devices page where you can look at it. They all do the same basic idea, and it's really important information. What's your battery life on your ADS-B receiver? How old is your weather? How many ground stations are you getting? How good's your GPS reception? These are all important things to know about your ADS-B receiver. Here's an example, too, in ForeFlight where you can go even deeper on that Stratus status page. If you have ADS-B out installed in your airplane, you can tap on that own ship ADS-B out, and the app through Stratus will detect it, and you can see exactly what you're reporting out. Here's what your call sign is. Here's your ICAO address. Here's your altitude and speed. Again, this is a good way to check and see what are you reporting out, and is it really the right thing? Good way to troubleshoot. You can show ADS-B ground stations. I don't think this is something you need to do all the time. Um, but if you're in an area of marginal coverage or you're concerned you weren't getting current weather, this is something to look at. On the left, you see Garmin Pilot there. Uh, you can see a map of them. Uh, on the right is ForeFlight. It's uh, an option you can turn on in the Stratus status menu. You can show ADS-B stations. Also understand how to charge your ADS-B receiver if it has a, a built-in battery. Know your ba device's battery life. As I said, Stratus and Clarity are the tops there with about eight hours. The Garmin Dual and I-Level are more in that three to five hour range. But most of these need two amp chargers, just like your iPad, that the lower amp, one amp sort of iPhone charger won't cut it. So make sure you're using two amps. 
And in general, I like to charge these when I charge my iPad. So if I'm going to go flying tomorrow, uh, I'm going to make sure the night before my iPad is charged up and my ADS-B receiver is charged up, and I've got some type of backup power if I need it. Almost all these devices will allow you to connect to multiple devices. So uh, the GDL39, for example, will allow you to connect to two devices at once. Stratus will allow you to connect to over 10 devices, actually, with Wi-Fi. Point is, take advantage of that. If you fly with a co-pilot, you and your co-pilot can both have an iPad connected to the ADS-B receiver. If it's just you, maybe you have a smartphone. You want to connect your phone and your tablet to it for backup. Take advantage of that. I like to use the measure tool. This is in ForeFlight, but again, this feature is available in other apps as well. Uh, very, very handy way to, to do something with the weather you're looking at. So in ForeFlight, if you tap two fingers on the screen at the same time, it'll measure the distance between those two points. You can expand it, move it around. Um, it also tells you your time and route and your track. And it's just really helpful for getting a sense of how far away am I from that line of weather? How long will it be flying through that rain? What's, how far away is my diversion point right now? Um, it, it's really a handy tool that I use for a lot of different uses with weather. I also really like rubber band flight planning. And this is where you can, uh, instead of typing in a new route, you can just grab your route line. In the case of four flight here, you would tap and hold your current route line and then drag it out of the way of the weather. Here's an example where we're flying from Cincinnati up towards Chicago. And there's a big, ugly blob of rain right in the middle. There's no way we're going to fly through that. And we could obviously fly up close to that, get our eyes on it, and start talking to air traffic control about 10 degrees left or 20 degrees right. Uh, that, can, that can be tough sometimes, though, and it's tough for ATC to know really what your plan is. So in this situation, we just changed our route and said, well, how about direct to the boiler VOR uh, and then the rest of the route unchanged? Worked great because ATC knew exactly what we wanted to do. They could put in their computer. We know what we were doing, and we knew we were going to miss the weather by a healthy margin. So uh, don't be afraid to use that rubber band flight planning and just move your route until it's clear of the weather. Remember that delay. Again, we talked about checking status and how old your weather is. ADSB is not real-time weather. As I said, no data link weather is real-time. So you should not be using this stuff to pick through tightly stacked lines of embedded thunderstorms. This is a strategic picture. And it's very, very good for that. So I don't mean to minimize that, but understand the delay. You're not looking at real-time weather. So keep an eye on that timestamp you see there. Make sure your weather is up-to-date, at least as up-to-date as it can be. And finally, while it may seem obvious, use your eyeballs. Uh, the ADSB weather product is fantastic, and I wouldn't fly without it, but it only gets one vote, and your eyes get another vote and probably a veto as well, because if it looks ugly, you don't want to fly through it, regardless of what the radar says. Take this example here, that storm off to the left. If that wasn't showing up on radar yet, maybe because it's still a developing thunderstorm, well, I don't care what the radar says, there's no way we're going to fly through that, right? If it looks scary out the window, don't fly through it. Don't, uh, don't become a slave to the, to the iPad. Don't become a slave to the ADSB weather. It's a great tool, but it's only one tool. Make sure your eyes agree. With that, we'll wrap up. Did want to mention one website that may be helpful for you. It's called iPadPilotNews.com. Uh, it's focused on the iPad, but it also covers a lot of uh, portable ADSB receivers and how they work with iPad apps. So if you're looking for more information on these portable receivers, there's some good information there, some webinars, some videos, some tips. I encourage you to check that out. With that, we'll close out. I have my email address there on the screen if you have questions afterwards. Uh, but I thank you for attending today, and I hope you got a lot out of it. hope you understand a little bit better about ADSB and can help make the right decisions as we all move towards 2020. So thanks again, and hope to see you again on another Sporties webinar.